Good morning. Happy New Year. It's coming. Maybe more than any other year in recent memory, we are looking forward to a new year, right? I got done with 2020 when we lost Sean Connery. That was it for me. I was done. That was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Um, I was I was at the church uh, a couple months ago, and I was in the concourse, kind of waiting to greet some folks. And uh, I, I, I'm nosy like that, so I started digging around and uh, one of the welcome desks, and I found this. It's a My 2020 Commitments card. We handed this out last year, clearly optimistic about what 2020 would be. And uh, I, I began to read these, and I thought how 2020 and, and coronavirus in particular has kind of torpedoed a lot of maybe the commitments that we had. So I'm going to read some of these. Um, I will serve regularly in this ministry, and then there's a blank. Serving became really difficult in 2020, right? If you signed this card, if you filled something out there, odds are you probably weren't able uh, to serve in the way that you wanted to this year. We were still able to serve. We still did a lot of great things, but it changed uh, how we serve. There's another one. Um, I will support the missions efforts of our church by, and then there's a blank. Perhaps you were planning on going on a mission trip this year, going overseas, and that didn't happen perhaps either unless you got out in January or February. And then my personal favorite on here is, I will be in worship with fellow believers. Sorry, I can't even read that without kind of cracking up laughing. Uh, we've been able to be together, sort of, uh, virtually, uh, and praise God for the technology that we have. Um, even Kyle's dad, the, the young man who was baptized this morning, was able to watch uh, online uh, his son's baptism, uh, which is really cool, but it's still, as we know, it's not the same, uh, perhaps, for, for many of us to not be in person. And so, uh, yeah. Things have changed this year, and, and, and we're looking forward to 2021, hoping uh, that when the calendar flips, right, we'll be able to uh, uh, move forward in some way. And, and if anything, 2020 has shown us that no matter what kind of commitments or resolutions we make, the future is uncertain, and we're not always able uh, to do what we want to do despite the fact that we long for control. And, and usually we respond to this in one of three ways. Some of us are optimistic and we're like, yeah, no matter what happens, next year's gonna be great and everything's gonna be fantastic. Some of us are fearful. We're like, yeah, I don't know what's gonna hold. It's probably gonna be worse. You've, got like, you've gone like full on Eeyore or Piglet. I guess Piglet's the scared one. You're just like, oh, da 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 You know, you're just worried about everything. That was my best Piglet. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and then... There's some of you that are just cynical, like straight up like, yeah, it's just another year. Who cares? It's just another thing. That's more Eeyore. There we go. So what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about three commitments that we can make as we come home to the futures. The future rather uh, seems to come home to us, right? The future is always approaching. Three commitments that we can make that regardless of circumstances, we can stay consistent in them. No matter what happens next year, we can do that. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 38. This is one of my favorite passages in scripture. And first, I want to talk about the optimist. So if you're the optimistic person, the person that's like super pumped, uh, the first thing you need to do, the first commitment you need to make this year is you need to wait. Say, I will wait. So as Jesus is born, uh, the obligation for the family at that point, because he's the firstborn son, is to take him and dedicate him to the Lord. He's circumcised on the eighth day. And so they take him up to the temple in Jerusalem, which would have been about a two-hour walk up from Bethlehem, so not that far. And they brought him to Jerusalem. They bring him into the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. And there they meet a man named Simeon. Look at verse 25. In Jerusalem at the time, there was a man, Simeon by name, a good man, a man who lived in the prayerful expectancy of help for Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. So we don't know a lot about Simeon. Uh, from extra biblical literature, we think that he was probably maybe a priest, maybe not. Uh, we know that he is old, uh, and we gather this from later on in the passage, but some sources say that he was as old as 112 years old. So we don't know a lot about him, but what we do know about him is really significant. Notice it says that he was a good man. So in the message, uh, the message translation or paraphrase kind of puts, uh, puts two words together to make good man. Uh, in, in other translations, it's righteous and pious. So to be a righteous man in Scripture, that's like one of the highest compliments you can get. Job was a righteous man man. We know Jesus is our righteousness. So this is a big deal. It's not the same thing, Jesus and, and Simeon's righteousness, but uh, the same words being used here. So it's a big deal. He's devoted to the Lord. He's consistent in his actions. It also says he's pious. That means he's a worshiper of God. He's consistent in his actions and his thoughts and his deeds. He's not a hypocrite. He's pious. 
It also says that he lived in the prayerful expectancy of help for Israel. That means he's looking forward to the arrival of the Messiah, to throw off the oppression of the Gentiles. He's looking forward to the Messiah arriving, and he's looking forward to what God is going to do to bring about salvation for his people. So he's expecting God to do something great. And then it says the Holy Spirit was on him. Now, we are reading this passage, even though the Gospels are found in the New Testament, because Jesus has not been crucified, buried, and resurrected, and the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. The Gospels kind of live in this weird sort of in-between state between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So some things we have to read with sort of an Old Testament lens on, even though we're reading in the New Testament. And so when it says the Holy Spirit was on him, it doesn't mean that he had the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of him. It means that he had been specially picked out for a special, unique purpose by God. Moses had the Holy Spirit dwelling on him. Joshua had the Holy Spirit resting on him. Samson, when he would uh, do his big acts of strength, right, when he would hulk out on some people, the Holy Spirit came upon him in order for him to do that. But we learn the most important thing about Simeon is actually in the next verse. The Holy Spirit had shown him that he would see the Messiah of God before he died. He's been told that in his lifetime, before he passes away, the Messiah, he's going to meet the one that God has picked out from eternity past to bring deliverance to to the people. Now, if you think about this, Simeon may have been the first person to know that Jesus, to know the Messiah was going to be born in his lifetime, right? So if we wind it back through the, the, the Christmas stories, right, the wise men probably didn't receive any kind of direct revelation. They were just following a star and they knew it was important. But they may not have known it was to lead them to Messiah. They knew it was going to be a king. So that was maybe two years in advance. Elizabeth, Zechariah, the the aunt and uncle of Jesus, probably received an announcement 18 months in advance. Mary and Joseph, nine months in advance. The shepherds, that very night that he was born, Simeon maybe heard this word from the Lord 50, 60 years before. And he's waiting. And he's waiting. And he's waiting. And he's waiting. Some of us are a lot like Simeon. We're waiting for something to happen. And we enter into seasons of time in our lives that seem to be filled with a lot of promise. And we're hoping that God is going to do something to make those, that, that season of promise, that season of potential come to fruition. Just like Simeon was waiting on an actual promise from God to be fulfilled, we enter into new seasons of our life expecting a, a potential to be realized. It's not the same thing, but it's a similar concept of expectancy. So when you're a little, little kid, little boy, little girl, you'd meet somebody new, what was one of the things they'd ask you? They'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Why don't we ask like 50, 60, 70 year old people what they want to be when they grow up? Maybe we should because I'm a big kid too. Maybe I need to grow up, right? We, we ask people what they want to be when they grow up because we see the potential that a young life has and we want to see what promises they're going to fulfill in their life. But any time we enter into a new season, we, we sort of have this hope, this, this sense of promise come about in our life, right? When you, when you enter into a new relationship, young adults, single adults, you get excited, right? This could be the one. This could be so much promise fulfilled. When you get married, being a newlywed, right? Oh, the expectation that you have when you give birth to a new child, the hope the expectation, what is this little boy, little girl going to grow up to be? And when we go into a new year, it's the same thing. A new year creates a natural demarcation in our calendar where we're able to say, okay, that was last year. Some things happened. It's one way to say it. The new year, what might happen? What promise might be realized? What potential might we be able to fulfill? And so we're waiting, and we're waiting for those, that season of promise to come to fruition, And for some of us, we've waited a long time. Even the most ardent optimist in us can wind up becoming despairing and discouraged because what we're waiting for isn't happening in the time that we want it to. And what we need to understand as followers of Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus, one of the things that is our lot in life, one of the things that you sign up for when you become a Christian, and you may not have known this, is waiting. Waiting is part of being a believer. Every single one of us is waiting for Jesus Christ to return, 
to come back, to raise the dead and give them new bodies, to give us new resurrected bodies, that we might live in a new heaven and a new earth free of disease and death and disability. There's, there's not going to be any pain or suffering there. We're all going to have purpose and significance. We're not just going to be important, we're going to feel important. We're going to matter, know that we matter to the Lord. And so what's important for us to do is we wait for things. And we all have things we're waiting for, personal longings in our life. You have to look at that personal longing that you have in your life and cast it against the backdrop of the greater longing of waiting for Christ's return. Now, that can seem really complicated. So what do I mean by it? Well, let's take waiting for a spouse. It's a really good example, waiting for a spouse. Many of us want to get married. Many of us have gotten married, right? And when you get married, you're expecting certain things from your spouse, certain uh, uh, perhaps uh, holes in your life that you feel, you're expecting a spouse to fulfill those places, right? Companionship, loneliness, those things won't be there hopefully anymore because you have this other person in your life. Well, God does not promise us spouses. He hasn't made that promise to each of us. He hasn't said, hey, you're going to get married, everybody's going to get married. But what he has promised is that somehow, some way, loneliness is going to be chased away by him. A lack of companionship is going to be chased away by him. And especially when he returns, that's going to be fulfilled, particularly when he returns. But he also may fulfill it in other ways in our life. So we're waiting. When you start a new job, that's another one. Uh, uh, if you're, if you're, maybe you're stuck in a job and you don't really like it. And you're like, oh, this is kind of terrible. I don't really want to do this anymore. I don't feel like I'm significant. I don't feel like I'm making a difference. And some of you might, might be here in that place. And so you're waiting for things to change. You can cast that lack of, that seeming lack of significance against the greater backdrop of God's plan, his greater plan. And you can say, he wants me to be significant. And one day I will feel the significance that I truly have in him. And so we're all waiting for God to do something great. We all have things that we're longing for, things we're waiting for. So how do we wait well? How do we wait well, I think we can look at Simeon. At the four qualities that's described in him, we can also do those things to wait well. How about righteousness? He was righteous. So when you're waiting, it's easy to take shortcuts. How many of you see, your tra- see a traffic jam and you're like, oh, I gotta get around this. I'm not gonna wait in this. You're just like, boom. You're like, all of a sudden, Fast and the Furious just takes over your body and you're like, I've gotta go. You become like a mini Vin Diesel out there rolling around. It's tempting to take a shortcut because you don't like to wait. And sometimes we take shortcuts with what God has promised. We, we see things in his word and we're like, oh, he wants me to do this, but it doesn't feel good or it doesn't make a lot of sense logically, right? So being a young adult singles minister, I work with uh, people who are, are dating. And, and for many of them, they're like, hey, I'm going to move in with my significant other. And the reason why you would do that is, again, totally it makes logical sense to me. We're going to try out and see what this is like because we're looking forward to getting married. Or you're going to sit there and think to yourself, well, we like each other. It's expensive to live by yourself. We're going to share. It totally makes logical sense for me. The problem is Scripture has guided us towards something else, towards staying away from any appearance of sexual immorality. And again, it doesn't always make sense, but that's what God's called us to do. And so when we're waiting and we're actively waiting, We're not going to take shortcuts. It says he was pious, right? So we can be pious. We give God glory in the midst of our waiting. So even though we're waiting for a long time, even though we may not be as optimistic as we want to be, we still give God praise and glory and honor in the midst of our waiting. It says the spirit was on him. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him as your savior, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, which is different than what Simeon had. It's better. And so the Spirit is going to lead us to do things. Waiting is not just sitting around on your hands. Waiting is active. It's actively engaged. It's actively being a part of what God is doing right now while you wait. So see where God would have you serve. And then he was expectant. He was looking forward to something. Now, Simeon's understanding of what the Messiah would do probably was different than what it wound up being. Simeon probably expected some kind of political military leader and thought he would overthrow the Roman Empire, at least in Israel. That didn't make him bad. It just made him wrong about what he was expecting. Sometimes we're expecting God to do certain things, but we kind of get it a little wrong. And that's okay. Because ultimately we need to trust in the Lord to do the things, to to fulfill those greater longings that we have, even in ways that we don't expect. 
So as we're waiting, particularly you optimists, I know it's hard to wait because you want it now. You want those things now. So we need to wait. We need to be committed to waiting. But especially if you are fearful, that's one of the other categories we talked about this morning. If you're a fearful person, what do you do then? Well, we need to trust God. We need to trust God in the good and the bad. I will trust. So when Simeon meets uh, Jesus and Mary and Joseph, he takes the baby in his arms, which I would not recommend. If you have a word from the Lord, just don't go randomly grabbing people's children out of their hands. That's strange. It worked back then. Not cool now. Uh, But he comes upon them and he says something to him. Look at verse 27. Led by the spirit, he entered the temple. And as the parents of the child, Jesus brought him in to carry out the rituals of the law. Simeon took him into his arms and blessed God. God, you can now release your servant. He's talking about himself. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. It's now out in the open for everyone to see. A God-revealing light to the non-Jewish nations and of glory for your people, Israel. Simeon's saying, I'm done. I can rest. And it's not like I can quit following God. It's like a, a, a worker whose shift is over. He's like, finally, my shift is done. This is what I've been living my entire life to see, and it's arrived. And then he makes a big proclamation of praise. Again, let's go back and read it. It's huge. God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you've promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. It's now out in the open for everyone to see. A God-revealing light to the non-Jewish nations and of glory for your people, Israel. Simeon says, this is great news because the Messiah is here. He's salvation for the world and he's a light. He's a light of revelation for the Gentiles. Largely, the story of the Messiah has thus far been focused on the Jewish nation largely on the Jewish nation. But there have been some key Gentiles, non-Jewish people in the story. Rahab, Ruth, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus the Great. But now it's going to be out in the open. Everybody to see it. And that's glory for the nation of Israel. Because Israel's the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But the prediction, the prophecy that Simeon makes, much like our futures, is not all rainbow sprinkles and puppy dogs. He makes some comments, and this is the first time in in any of the birth announcements that have been thus far in the Gospel of Luke, this is the first time that anybody initiates, anybody intimates that there is going to be some negative side to this. It's not all going to be good news. Look what he says in verse uh, 33. Jesus' father and mother were speechless with surprise at these words. Simeon went on to bless them, and then he said to Mary, his mother. And I feel like that should be but he said to Mary, his mother. This child marks both the failure and the recovery of many in Israel, a figure misunderstood and contradicted, the pain of a sword thrust through you, but the rejection will force honesty as God reveals who they really are. Now, if you've ever had children or maybe you're pregnant right now, uh, that would not be like a birth card that I would want to receive, you know, from somebody like, hey, congratulations on your new baby. And then you open it up and read that. You're like, oh, it doesn't seem all that optimistic. He says that Jesus is essentially going to be the fulcrum, the center point around which every human being's life is judged as a success or a failure. And if you're a success, then Jesus is your cornerstone. And what that means is that you have put your faith and trust in Jesus. So we've all done things that are wrong. We live in a condition of sin. It's like a genetic disorder passed down from person to person to person. We are in a sinful state. And because of that, we can't please God. We can't have a relationship with him. And so that's why God sends his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And so we have an opportunity to, rather than to trust in ourselves, trust in our own ability to please God, what we can do is we can trust God in Christ and say, I want his work to count for me. I want to be forgiven based on what he's done, not on what I've done, because I can't meet that standard. And when that happens, Jesus becomes your cornerstone. That's essentially what Kyle was saying earlier. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Jesus is my cornerstone. He's the one around whom I'm going to build my entire life, and the Spirit will build your life around him, culminating in his return and our glorification. That's the journey of the Christian. That's how he's your cornerstone. But if you reject him, if you say, I'm going to try and handle this on my own, I'm going to take care of this in my own way, then Jesus is no longer a cornerstone for you. He's a stumbling stone. What that means is it's like a rock in the middle of a a road or a path that someone who's blind would trip over because they couldn't see it. And Mary is told that basically you're going to have to watch 
as Jesus is not a unifier necessarily, but a divider. And you see this throughout the Gospels. We all talk about how we should just rally around Jesus. Yeah, we should. But the problem is, even when Jesus was here on earth, he was dividing people. Mothers and sons and fathers and brothers. He talks about this. And yes, we have unity in Christ, of course. But there are some, in in rejecting Christ, you can't, it creates conflict, it creates friction, right? And Mary's told this is going to be painful for you to watch because as they reject him, you are going to be hurt as well. I mean, what mother wants to watch her son suffer? Not just uh, the physical death of Jesus Christ, but the actual difficulty, the trauma of watching him make these decisions, pursue what God has for his life and has to stand by and watch as he does it. And Mary's pain and grief leads her to trust God. And I believe that she trusts God with this. And the reason why I believe that is because look at what she does the rest of her life. She's there with him all the time. She's at the wedding in Cana when he turns the water into wine. We talked about this last week. She's, she goes to, to Capernaum to say, hey, Jesus, people are starting to talk. We, we want to protect you. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. You can't protect me anymore. And she goes with him all the way to the cross. Simeon's prophecy of Jesus' life, the good and the bad, sounds a lot like what we're facing in 2021. There will be good things, of course, but there will be bad things. And I don't think we're naive to to know that. I think it's right to be in some ways fearful, afraid perhaps, not a slave to the fear, but fearful of what 2021 might hold. Because we do have a lot to look for. We've got a a vaccine that's hopefully going to help, right? Maybe the job market improves. Maybe people still get sick, but not as seriously sick. But also people are going to die in 2021. And not just from COVID, from the other things that plague our society. This might be your last New Year's. The last time that you hear somebody talk about resolutions and commitments. Maybe your marriage survived COVID, but it's not going to survive the next year. Maybe you're going to find out something like Mary found out that you're like, man, I wish I hadn't found that out. When it comes to 2021, we have to determine now on the cusp of this new year, before we get into it, what kind of people we will be. And even though we might be afraid, we have to commit to trusting in God with the good things and with the bad things. And I think this is what Mary does. And that's why she goes with Jesus every step of the way. Is that what you're going to do? Are you going to trust him? Are you going to trust God with the good and the bad? Are you going to trust him that he's working, even when you can't see him, even when it doesn't feel like he's working, even when it feels like he's far away? Are you still going to trust him? Or are you only a committed follower of Jesus when it feels like he's committed to you? So how do we do this? How do we trust God with the big and the small? Well, and the good and the bad. I I think one of the things that we have to do is from the moment we wake up, it's got to be on our mind. What do most people do when they wake up in the morning? Reach over and grab what? Phone, right? Grab my phone. Look at it, see what's going on. We have to commit that no matter what comes across that phone that day, whether it's good news, bad news, text, email, phone calls, we're going to trust God with it. And so you make that commitment every morning, Lord, I'm going to trust you with whatever comes across this phone. And then we look at our phone. And if you can't make that statement in the morning, That means there's something that that maybe there's doubt or fear in your life. You offer that up to God. God, I'm having a hard time trusting you today. Please be with me. Please give me the faith I need to trust you because I want to trust you despite my doubts and despite my fears. And if you want to know whether or not you're actually trusting him, look at what determines whether or not it's a good day or a bad day for you. Is it determined by how you feel? If you feel good in the morning and you feel good most of the day, it was a good day. But if you feel bad, it was a bad day. What about circumstances? If things go well in the day, then it was a good day. If things go poorly, it's a bad day. That's idolatry. You're idolizing your circumstances. You're idolizing your feelings. That's what's determining what is good and bad in your life. What about approval or personal success? If I accomplished a lot today, then that means it was a good day. And if I didn't get anything done or if I had conflict with somebody, it was a bad day. Or is it governed by what God says, what he's done for you, what he says about you? So are you going to stay in the word? Are you going to be in prayer? Is that the way that you determine what a good day is? Are you exploring who God is? God is infinite. We're about to start a new series next month about how God is beyond anything we can possibly imagine. We like to put God in a box because we like to control him. 
or try to. Next month, we're going to talk about how God isn't that. So are you exploring who he is? Are you trying to trust him in new ways? Are you going to take risks for him? Because when we put God in a box, we also put ourselves in the box with him and thinking God would never ask me to do this, this, and this. Are we going to take risks for the kingdom of God? We've got to trust him with the good and the bad. We've got to wait for him to work. And then for those of us who are cynical, and I know there are some of you out there, I tend to be that way sometimes myself, we have to be faithful. We have to be faithful. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from an elderly righteous man to an elderly righteous woman. Look at verse 36. Anna the prophetess was also there, a daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She was by now a very old woman. She had been married seven years and a widow for 84. She never left the temple area, worshiping night and day with her fastings and prayers. At the very time Simeon was praying, she showed up, broke into an anthem of praise to God, and talked about the child to all who were waiting expectantly for the freeing of Jerusalem. Again, we know very little about Anna. But what we do know about her is that she was married at some point, which would have been normal for a woman her, uh, uh, of that day. She lived with him for seven years, and then he died. And rather than being remarried, and she would have been, because she uh, still had childbearing uh, ages ahead of her, and that was, that was highly valued in that society, she should have been married again, and, and she would have had a life of predictability and security. It would have been a good life. Instead, she says, no, I'm going to stay committed to the Lord. And so she goes and lives at the temple, not lives necessarily, but stays up there all the time, praying and fasting and committed to it. And here's the thing. She gets to meet the Messiah because of this. She's not like Simeon. Simeon got a word from the Lord, got led by the Spirit to that place specifically for that. She didn't have that. She got to meet the Messiah. She got to meet Jesus face to face because she was doing what she was supposed to be doing. She was committed and she was faithful. And because she was faithful, God did something amazing in her life. We've said this before, but being faithful is the measure of success for a believer. Sticking by the Lord, staying committed to him, and staying committed to the commitments you make to others in his name. It's not whether you win or lose. It's not how much money you have. It's not how successful you are. It's not how influential you are. It's whether or not you are faithful. It's whether or not you stick with it. You continue to follow the Lord no matter what happens. And this is really what it means to, to come home to the future. Because when you think about it, like we're really good at finding Jesus in the past, Right? We can look at the scripture. It's a thousands of year old document. We can look at it, see how God worked in the life and we see how Jesus was active and be like, yeah, I believe in that Jesus. Or maybe we can look back at windows in our own life and be like, yeah, back in my 20s or back in my 30s, I, I saw how God was working. I didn't see it then, but I totally see it now. We're good at seeing Jesus in the past. We're even pretty good at seeing him in the present. Sometimes it's hard, but we can be like, I feel like the Lord is with me or I think the Lord is leading me this way. I think the one where we really struggle is in the future. We struggle to see and trust that God is actually going to be faithful to us in the future. And that's what coming home to the future is. It's coming home to the realization, the trust that Jesus Christ is going to be there for me no matter what. We're not going to make a 2021 My Commitments card, not because that was a bad idea. It was a great idea. We're just not doing it this year. But what if your commitment, what if your resolution this year is simply, Lord, what would you have me do? Who would you have me become? And no matter what happens, for good or for ill, staying committed and trusting to him. I think 2021 in one way in particular is going to be worse than 2020. I know, sorry, bearer of bad news. I think it's going to be harder to stay faithful. Because this year in 2020, we needed him. We needed him a lot. We still need him. But it was a felt need. As things open up, as things get better, as the vaccine takes hold, that need maybe will drift away, that felt need. So how do we combat this? You're going to hear things next year, throughout the year. You're going to hear uh, all sorts of things like, man, uh, this time last year we couldn't do this. So this time last year we had to wear a mask. Or this time last year we had to be socially distanced. And are any of you familiar with the the story of Pavlov's dog? Pavlov's dog was a a dog of a scientist, a psychologist, and he he trained the dog that every time uh, he would ring a bell, he would give him some food. And so the dog began to salivate whenever he heard the bell. And so uh, Pavlov eventually took away the food, and he would still salivate even when he heard the bell, even though there was no food. He trained him. So I want you to be trained this year, that whenever you hear somebody compare this year to last year, I don't want you to salivate because that's gross. But what I do want you to do is I want that to be a trigger for you to say, am I trusting the Lord? 
Am I staying faithful to him? Am I trusting more in the good things that are happening? Or am I being faithful to him? How can I be faithful in this moment? Every time, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear it on the news. You're going to hear it in conversation. You're going to hear it from this pulpit. And I want that to be a trigger for you to say, man, I know exactly what it is I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be faithful to the Lord. Lord, forgive me for the ways that I've walked away from you. Forgive me the ways that I failed to be faithful in this, that, and the other. Make it a, a, just an anthem every time, a triggered response. Because yeah, 2021 might be better. But if we're not careful, if it doesn't get better quickly, if we're not careful, if we're not faithful to the Lord, no matter what happens, we might get caught out. We might be cynical and discouraged early on. So for those of you who are optimistic, who are excited about what's happening in the next year, God bless you. Share it with the rest of us. But wait. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. For those of you who are fearful, who are scared, I get it. Trust the Lord with the good and the bad. Trust him with everything. But no matter what happens, whatever comes across your desk or your email or whatever, trust him. And then for those of you who are cynics, and I get that too, be faithful. Don't quit. Don't give in to the cynicism and the, the, the discouragement and sort of that, that attitude that goes with it. Give in to faith and give in to faithfulness. Trust the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, of trust. We're trusting you with our uncertainties and we're a people who want to be faithful to you, God. And so I pray that we would be. That we'd be full of faith and that faith would lead to commitment and faithfulness to you. Lord, grant us patience. Grant us the encouragement that we need to carry on. And may you be glorified in everything that happens from here 